Uh, okay, uh, yeah, so uh, you're familiar with the title of my today's talk, uh, So Technologies and Pedagogies for Advancing Organizational Learning, Knowledge Sharing and Goal Management. And uh, my initial, uh, let's say, proposal was uh, to cover within this talk uh, two topics. One topic is organizational learning and knowledge sharing, whereas the other is organizational goal management. But then I realized that uh, if I would want to properly cover both of these topics, I would uh, take a very long time. It would take a very long time and uh, probably get boring after some time. So I decided uh, to cover one topic. Uh, the first one, and uh, in particular, I have chosen this one since I believe that uh, uh, people who would be who are participating uh, would be primarily interested, actually more interested in the first one. Of course, uh, if someone of you would be interested, uh, I can later today or during my stay here say something about uh, the other one as well. Uh, so, regarding organizational learning and knowledge sharing, what I am going to talk about is actually uh, a part of the research work that has been done in the scope of uh, the Interleo European project. It is an FP7 project which, which has uh, just finished. I mean, the official uh, finish day end date was uh, April the 30th, though we are still waiting for a review meeting, final review meeting, and see how we are going to pass there. Uh, of course, I'm not going to talk about the entire project and um, that has been things that have been done in the entire project, but I'm just going to focus on one aspect of the project, uh, uh, research work that has been done in the project, and it is the part that has been done by Athabasca University, so um, the group the, led by Dragan Gashevich, whom you met here and who uh, gave a presentation also, uh, my university, University of Belgrade, and uh, Tallinn University. And uh, this is the research work that uh, is still going on, uh, even though the project is uh, officially finished. So it's not something that is part of the past, but an ongoing thing. So in this particular part uh, of the research work that I uh, want to focus on, uh, the main research challenge was uh, how to support organizational embedded personal learning at workplace. So it is about uh, personal learning in workplace environments. But uh, this personal learning does not mean that a person is uh, learning on his or her own fully uh, separately. Uh, it is a learning that is by an individual but uh, embedded in, uh, let's say, social and organizational context of work environment. And in order to address uh, this research challenge, uh, we started uh, from the existing literature. And this is where we had the huge support from uh, TLU, especially, if I have to say, from Kai. Um, and uh, with her help, uh, we uh, investigated this area and identified that there are three basic modes of uh, workplace learning. Uh, the first one uh, is incidental and informal learning. And it is uh, uh, the most typical uh, form of learning um, it is a learning that uh, takes place uh, while people are doing their work-related activities. And it is incidental since it is not planned in advance. And uh, it is informal since uh, people do not follow some uh, formal courses uh, or um, uh, some training sessions and things like that. And it is even the case that uh, people are often not aware uh, that they are doing some learning while performing their work-related activities. Uh, the second kind of, uh, uh, let's say, workplace learning is intentional but non-formal learning. So unlike the previous mode of learning, we have here this intentional component. So a person is uh, planning uh, what he or she wants uh, to learn about and deciding how to learn and monitoring uh, his or her learning process and so on. But it is still not formal. So still no formal offer. Uh, uh, formal course offerings or formal uh, job session, uh, training sessions. Uh, though a uh, person can, uh, for example, uh, attend some uh, webinars or some web-based uh, training, but uh, in any case, it is something that that specific individual decides for him or herself and not something that is imposed by a manager or human resource department or something like that. And uh, the final uh, third form of uh, workplace learning uh, takes uh, uh, happens in the form of uh, formal on-the-job or off-the-job training. And this is, uh, let's say, the usual thing that uh, organizations prepare, organize for their employees. 
Uh, in this uh, research, uh, we are focusing on the second type, on intentional but not formal uh, learning. So uh, this kind of learning, as I already mentioned, uh, requires uh, self-regulation. So it requires uh, from a person to decide uh, what is to be learned, so what kind of comp uh, competencies are to be acquired, uh, how to learn, so what kind of learning activities to perform, uh, what kind of resources to use, also when to learn, so to allocate time for learning, which can be difficult if someone um, is already doing a lot of work. Uh, it requires uh, motivation for learning and proactive approach to learning. And it unfortunately rarely happens, uh, primarily due to the lack of personal initiative and lack of self-regulation skills. So problem in personal initiative is primarily related to motivation, while as regarding self-regulation, it has been shown that uh, uh, not that many people have uh, self-regulation sk regulation skills and something that is inborn, something that, re that is uh, their intrinsic uh, capacity or capability, but it is something that is uh, to be learned. So um, in order to, uh, let's say, um, uh, support this kind of learning at workplace, uh, there is a need uh, to facilitate the, let's say, realization of these self-regulated learning practices. Um, regarding uh, the planning and execution of, uh, let's say, learning, uh, learning activities, and first planning what is to be learned and then how to be learned and so on, uh, it is uh, uh, very, uh, at least our assumption is that it would be very useful if uh, people are, uh, are provided with recommendations, recommendations regarding different kinds of learning resources. Uh, first, what are the competencies to be acquired? Then, uh, what, uh, when someone decides uh, what to learn, that is, what competencies to acquire, then how to learn, what kind of uh, learning activities to perform, what kind of content to use, who are the people uh, who would be, let's say, good learning companions or people who are experts and uh, could be asked for some piece of help. Um, then for monitoring um, of one's uh, learning activities and reflection over those activities, uh, feedback can be very useful, or at least our assumption is that it can be very useful, uh, especially if it's uh, timely and, well inf and informative enough. Um, th and that covers the aspect of uh, that lack of self-regulation skills. And uh, regarding the problem of lack of, uh, let's say, motivation and uh, um, that lack of personal interest, uh, um, there is also a need to motivate somehow people to perform these self-regulating learning activities. And um, um, this is again something that we learn from uh, TLU people, from uh, Mart and Kai, uh, something that uh, according to the original, let's say, model of self-regulation, uh, it is uh, focused on individual. So uh, the individual, um, let's say, uh, the idea of the model is that uh, individual can be motivated uh, through aligning his or her learning activities with his or her uh, personal learning goals. But uh, here we have a learning that is embedded in social and organizational context. So it is not an isolated process and it has to uh, be compliant with uh, the organizational expectations and norms and uh, goals that the organization defines. And also, it's not only about the organization, but also the people uh, with whom someone is working with. So alignment with the uh, learning goals and activities of colleagues uh, could be very, very useful. Uh, and uh, there are so two, uh, let's say, things that, to be sh sh that should be somehow supported. Uh, facilitation of the execution of the, all, all those uh, self-regulated learning practices on one hand, and the other hand, the motivation, to address the motivation. And um, both things uh, uh, impose uh, some both technical challenges and organizational challenges. And uh, since I'm more technical person coming from technical background, I will uh, cover uh, primarily these technical challenges, though I'll try not to neglect those organizational and uh, psychological and let's say motivational parts. Uh, so the technical challenges uh, for supporting organizational embedded learning this is, uh, let's say, close related to what, uh, to what I uh, talked about yesterday in the context of personal learning environments. So first thing is uh, how to together and integrate data about uh, learning and working activities. 
Um, it is a fact that uh, many people, uh, when they perform their both working and learning-related learning activities at workplace, they use different kinds of tools and systems. And uh, this has been um, even, let's say, more present uh, with the introduction of uh, social software tools. Many companies uh, have accepted and uh, adopted the use of uh, social software tools in, uh, in workplace environments. And uh, so uh, workers, and especially knowledge workers today, are using all those different tools when, when learning and working. And uh, if we want to have an overall, uh, let's say, profile of a user, we need to have a way to integrate data about uh, uh, learning and work-related activities from those uh, different tools and services. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, the problem is that uh, different tools uh, typically have different way ways for representing that data and uh, for attaching meaning, associated meaning or semantics to the data. Um, the other problem also present in the context of personal learning environments and something that I, I mentioned yesterday is that uh, need uh, to, uh, let's say, determine the relevancy of certain piece of learning content in order to be able to recommend that learning content in a specific uh, learning situation, specific learning context. And then that problem of uh, ambiguous semantics, so not explicitly defined the semantics of learning content appears. And um, uh, of course, um, um, I, since people attended yes, majority of people yes, attended yesterday talk, I, I wouldn't um, go into these details now. Technical solution, um, the, the, the technical, can, there can be different technical solutions, but the solution that we followed in this research is the use of semantic web technologies. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, using ontologies for the integration of data and link semantic linking of data, and not only linking of uh, data about learning activities, but about uh, uh, data about those uh, pieces of uh, content, pieces of knowledge that has been created and uh, that have been created and shared uh, during learning activities. And also the use of formal uh, knowledge bases for explicit, uh, attaching explicit semantics uh, to content. And uh, I covered this part about formal knowledge bases, and uh, I remember Mart uh, had uh, some questions about it. So I, uh, in this talk, I wanted to, to cover this part a bit more, so to make it uh, more clear what, uh, what are available uh, knowledge bases and uh, uh, how is the situation uh, current, current, what is the current situation regarding these knowledge bases. So this is something, uh, that is uh, called the uh, Link Open Data Cloud, and it is actually a network uh, of uh, structured knowledge bases. So each uh, node uh, here, each circle that you see, is actually one uh, knowledge base. And uh, it is a knowledge base which is uh, structured in accordance, and data is represented in accordance with the semantic web uh, technologies. So everything is uh, machine processable. And um, uh, there, these different colors uh, are actually used uh, to represent, uh, let's say, different domains uh, that uh, these knowledge bases cover. Uh, so, for example, uh, this, uh, let's say, some pink color here uh, cover uh, the, the domain of medicine and uh, biology, biomedicine, and also biological, those, those different, um, let's say, biosciences. Uh, then, for example, uh, this uh, oops, this part over here uh, is about uh, different kind of um, demographic data and things like that. And uh, what is uh, particularly useful for this, uh, let's say, annotation of different kinds of learning content is, are the knowledge bases that are represented in blue in the, this part here. And I made a bigger picture of that. Uh, and uh, here, uh, DBpedia, which I mentioned yesterday, Freebase, OpenPsych, and uh, Umbel. Uh, these are uh, actually the four, uh, four major uh, knowledge bases uh, that are uh, used for, that can be used for, for semantic annotation of learning resources. Uh, each uh, knowledge base, each of these knowledge bases, um, actually cover the kind of uh, date, the kind of knowledge that you would find in any encyclopedia. Uh, 
for DVpedia, I mentioned yesterday that it is a machine processable version of Wikipedia, so all the knowledge that is in Wikipedia is also there. Um, and uh, we raised the yesterday question about uh, the validity of knowledge in the DVpedia and how clean the knowledge is there and valid and reliable. Alternative to DBpedia uh, is uh, something that is called Open Psych. Uh, Psych is a knowledge base that uh, has been created uh, for over 25 years uh, by a company which is called Psychor. And uh, it was uh, for a long period of time the most well known and the biggest, uh, let's say, structured knowledge base uh, which was known and available. Um, and uh, it was created uh, in a way that uh, knowledge engineers uh, were, let's say, extracting knowledge uh, from experts in different area and then, uh, let's say, formally representing that knowledge and encoding that knowledge. And the overall idea of that psych uh, project uh, was uh, to have all the human knowledge in, represented in a machine processable format so that uh, we can achieve that artificial intelligence that is uh, to enable machines to, let's say, reason uh, in a manner not identical to people, but as similar as possible to people. And after uh, some 20 and something years of the development of that psych, uh, uh, let's say, knowledge base, um, uh, let's say, people who were working on that and who were managing this process realized that they would need at least another 25 years in order to create something, uh, like, something like that. And also, uh, and it was a signal that it is not uh, a way to proceed further. And also at that time, uh, those projects of collective intelligence uh, became, uh, let's say, popular and, uh, let's say, successful on the web, like Wikipedia, like uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk and many other collective project, uh, projects of collective intelligence. And then they decided to open psych, and that's how open psych, uh, let's say, uh, is uh, how psych became open. And so we have their uh, knowledge, which is really expert knowledge, and uh, represented in a full, full uh, machine processable format, and uh, no, uh, let's say engineered by people who are experts in that area. So we have something that is. Uh, uh, reliable, more reliable than DBpedia, and uh, but as you can see, the, uh, this size actually of the node uh, reflects, uh, 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 let's say, the size of the knowledge base. And uh, even though this open psych uh, uh, has been developed for over 25 years, it is currently smaller than DBpedia. So we have uh, more reliable knowledge, but less quantity of knowledge. Which one is better? of course, depends on the domain. If we need a very, uh, for a certain uh, application, if we need very reliable knowledge base, uh, then we, we should probably, not probably, but definitely go with something like open psych. If, you know, some fault um, assumptions could be tolerated, then DBpedia would probably be a way to go. Uh, Freebase, as I mentioned yesterday, is um, again a product of collective intelligence. It is a, a knowledge base that has been uh, created uh, by, you know, collecting data from the web and by all, allowing people to, to create, um, let's say, new knowledge within directly. Uh, and uh, uh, Google acquired the free base a couple of years ago. And uh, about 10 days ago, Google introduced something that is called Knowledge Graph. So if you now search uh, Google for some, let's say, relevant people or geographical locations or things like that, something that is a kind of encyclopedia knowledge, uh, then you would get structured results besides those just links that, that were previously present. And yesterday I, I read uh, another uh, thing that, is, uh, uh, that can be very useful for this area, and uh, that is announcement from the Google that have, they have released a huge data set uh, which is about linking concepts uh, to, uh, let's say, two words. Uh, that is uh, what they call things and strings. So that, uh, that is something that can allow us now to annotate, um, uh, let's say, um, different kinds of resources, in our case, uh, learning resources with uh, real entities so that we know what something is about and not just have a string representation. Uh, it's a huge data set. For example, it has uh, over 7.5 million concepts uh, uh, related with uh, over 150 uh, billion um, uh, words and so on. 
So another huge resource that is available for this uh, semantic annotation. So this was a bit, uh, let's say, uh, maybe going out of context of my uh, general uh, uh, talk, but I wanted uh, to, let's say, better explain this part and uh, say that, um, let's say, exemplify that uh, there are currently resources that can be used for this semantic annotation, which was a problem for, for years. And so using uh, these uh, uh, technologies originating from the semantic web area research, we have uh, developed a tool which is uh, called LearnB. Uh, LearnB stands, actually it is abbreviation for learning biosis. Uh, biosis is a term which means way of life. Uh, so learning biosis means learning is a way of life. And it is, uh, in our opinion, completely compliant with the idea of self-regulated learning and proactive approach to learning. And it is, as I said, a tool that is aimed at supporting self-regulated learning in workplace environment. And it is uh, built by using uh, ontologies uh, for data integration and uh, these formal knowledge bases uh, for uh, semantic annotation of uh, learning content. And uh, I would like to say something about the use of these uh, technologies in particular in, in LearnB. Uh, regarding the ontologies that we use, uh, the ontologies uh, have been, uh, let's say, initially developed in our previous work prior to Interleo. Uh, but uh, within uh, the Interleo project, those ontologies uh, have been further developed and, um, and improved. And uh, that's why we call them Interleo ontologies. And all the ontologies uh, and their full specifications are available from the project's website. So I wouldn't spend time now, um, let's say, explaining and presenting these ontologies individually, but I would rather uh, use um, an illustrative, at least in my opinion, illustrative example of how they are used in, in LearnB. So let's say that we have a user, and that user is using a learning planner uh, component of uh, LearnB uh, in order to uh, organize uh, her, uh, let's say, learning activities at workplace. And let's suppose that uh, she wants to learn something about uh, semantic search. And that is, uh, learning about semantic search is her learning goal. And uh, also let's suppose that uh, she has uh, come across uh, this uh, Wall Street article about um, Google's, let's say, new, um, um, things, new things that Google is doing in the area of semantic search and some plans about semantic search in, uh, to be introduced in the Google main search product. And uh, let's also suppose that uh, she finds this um, article potentially relevant uh, for her uh, learning goal and she wants uh, to bookmark and annotate it so that she can easily retrieve it later. And for that purpose, she can use another tool that uh, has been developed in the scope of the project. It's a, we call it tagging tool and it allows a person to uh, bookmark and uh, annotate any web resource. So um, any web page uh, can be annotated with uh, tags as usual, but also with concepts from the main specific ontology and with the learning uh, goals of that particular person. And when uh, the user does uh, the, book, uh, the annotation on the bookmarking, uh, a set of ontology instances are created. Uh, in this case, since uh, it was a bookmarking event, an instance of bookmark event is created and it is associated with a timestamp, uh, actually the time and date when uh, the, this event occurred, and with the user who performed the event, and also with the resource that uh, was created within this event. And this resource, in this case, is a bookmark and it is associated with a document, in this case, this article, um, newspaper article which it annotates, and it is also associated with the number of metadata that the user added when uh, uh, bookmarking and annotating, so title and description and some tags and the level of visibility. And uh, let's now suppose that uh, after reading this uh, article, the user, um, let's say, find this article um, um, useful not only to her but potentially to her colleagues and she wants to share her reflections about this article uh, with her colleagues, and uh, she can do that uh, using uh, Wiki, for example. Uh, Media Wiki is something that is integrated, uh, uh, that Le LearnB knows how to work with. And uh, as uh, when she, let's say, updates a Wiki page uh, with this new uh, information, 
uh, again, a set of uh, ontology instances are created. In this case, uh, since this was uh, an event of editing a wiki page, an edit event is created and again associated with the timestamp when the event occurred and associated with the user who performed the event and also uh, with this wiki article. In this case, relationship is added to since some, some kind of content, new content is added to an existing article and it is associated with the environment um, uh, with the environment with, uh, where this event occurred, in this case it is a wiki. And you can say, oh, see also here that uh, uh, this wiki article is uh, associated, that is annotated with concepts from Wikipedia, semantic search and uh, Google search. Um, and I will say uh, in a few minutes uh, how this annotation uh, is done. And uh, also all the events uh, that, uh, that are performed by the given user um, uh, are uh, visible to the user and available to the user in LearnB within um, uh, her activity stream. So wherever the, the event occurs, it is going to be available to the user. And all the data about the user's activities are, um, are let's say, represented using a common model and uh, that can be seamlessly integrated. Uh, regarding the semantic annotation, so annotation with the, with the concepts from uh, formal knowledge bases, uh, we haven't uh, developed a tool by ourselves. Um, we, have, we are using a tool that uh, has been developed in another European project, it is IKS project, also FP, I think, 6 or FP7 project. And uh, this uh, Stamble tool, which was developed within that project is uh, further in the process of development uh, within uh, Apache Foundation. And um, we use it uh, to annotate uh, uh, concept, uh, we annotate learning content with DBpedia, but it is not strictly tied to uh, DBpedia, but it can be used with other, other knowledge ba uh, bases as well. Um, in order to uh, select the tool that we are going to use for, uh, for the annotation, uh, we did a rather comprehensive uh, study of, uh, comparative study of uh, uh, some available options. Um, the, in particular, we focus on uh, free tools. The um, first tool, KIM, uh, it stands for uh, Knowledge and Information Management Platform. Um, it is a commercial tool and it is not open source, but it is available for free for educational and research purposes. And the reason we included this uh, in this, uh, let's say, study, even though we intentionally want, uh, we initially wanted to focus on open source options, is because uh, Kim is considered currently as the best option for semantic annotation. We wanted to see if it's really like that. Um, Stumble, as I already said, is a tool de developed within a European project, and it's open source and freely available as the Arch, again, uh, freely available and open source tool. And uh, these uh, f uh, free, uh, f first uh, two tools, Scheme and Stumble, uh, were, let's say, tested with two different configurations. So all in all, we had uh, five different, uh, let's say, options for, uh, anno uh, for of annotation tools, and we compared them using numerous quantitative metrics. Uh, and uh, the results uh, showed that uh, Stumble is uh, the best option, at least according uh, to the things that we considered. Um, we are currently uh, finalizing the paper about uh, this uh, com uh, comparative analysis and uh, uh, we hope to have it ready for International Semantic Web Conference. So if someone would, e would be interested, uh, as soon as we are finished, I can share it with you. Um, so by using uh, these uh, technologies, we, uh, what we enable within Lurby, I will briefly cover what are the functionalities uh, it currently offers. Um, so, contextual recommendation of competencies. So, the first thing someone has to decide uh, is uh, what are the competencies uh, to be acquired. And uh, the recommendation of competencies uh, is available and based uh, on the, let's say, learning goals of the organization and uh, uh, some, let's say, learner profile that is, uh, that is available and some preferences of the learner that, that, is, that are available to the system. And uh, when someone decides um, what are those competencies that he or she wants to acquire, then the next kind of recommendation is recommendation of uh, learning paths to follow, uh, learning activities to perform, and content to use. Uh, then 
Uh, what is uh, also available is um, something that we call knowledge sharing profiles. Uh, so in order to uh, somehow motivate people to uh, share knowledge, uh, the, the idea is uh, to uh, make those, um, uh, let's say, uh, feed, make a feedback, uh, kind of analytics uh, based on, um, let's say, um, uh, knowledge sharing activities of different individuals. So to enable a person to see uh, how he or she stands uh, in comparison with other uh, with other colleagues uh, and uh, in terms of uh, sharing uh, sharing knowledge, sharing different kinds of learning content uh, and uh, what kind of learning content he or she has shared. Then uh, provision of usage information. So it is information about the usage of different kinds of uh, learning resources and um, like uh, some comments and notes and ratings um, and to be a something that uh, should be helpful when deciding uh, uh, what, what, what is to be used as a, as a learning content for performing learning activities. Uh, there is also uh, something that we call social wave. And uh, it is a, a kind of feature that uh, allows um, a person to follow um, other colleagues and uh, their activities, but not only to follow people, but also to follow learning resources. For example, if someone is uh, in the process of acquiring certain competence, then uh, he or she can subscribe to, to following that competence and see then everything that is happening related to that competence. For example, if some new content is available or some, or some new learning activity has been done by some other colleagues related to that competence and things like that. Uh, in order to support that uh, monitoring uh, and uh, self-reflection um, um, about the learning progress, uh, there is something that is called progressometer. It is actually a set of learning analytics that are used um, in order to provide the feedback uh, to the user regarding how he or she is progressing uh, towards uh, the learning goal. And, uh, there is an activity stream, so listing all the activities that are available, that has been happened and that has been performed by, by the given user. Um, we have uh, done, um, actually, the user study within the Intelio project. And there were two uh, studies that have been done, initial one uh, with, uh, let's say, some working prototype and uh, the final one with some more elaborated uh, prototype of the solution. And uh, even though uh, within the project we have uh, finalized this, um, the analysis of, the, of that, uh, let's say, um, elaborated prototypes, uh, we have not yet, um, um, let's say, analyzed the data from the perspective of LERBY. They were analyzed from the perspective of the overall project, but not those specific things that we are interested in LERBY. So I will uh, uh, present here the data and data analysis that we done uh, regarding that initial uh, user study, so something that has been analyzed fully. Uh, so our research questions uh, were uh, how do users perceive the usefulness of uh, these LERBY's functionalities when they perform self-regulated learning at workplace? And the other uh, question was uh, uh, whether there is uh, some kind of correlation, some association, uh, between uh, the perception of usefulness of LERBY's, uh, let's say, functionalities on one hand, and uh, uh, perception of usefulness of self-regulated learning practices. And uh, in order to address these research questions, as I said, we did, uh, um, let's say, um, user study within the Intelio project, and there were uh, three business cases within the project, rather different. Uh, and uh, the study was done um, on the site of each business case and some people here were involved in that and uh, probably know how it was done uh, within uh, business case three for which uh, TLU was responsible. And uh, I will uh, share with you uh, here uh, some, let's say, most important findings that we uh, got regarding LERMBY, so not overall project. Uh, the first thing is that uh, self-regulation workplace is highly driven by organizational context. So organizational requirements, expectations, opportunities. Uh, for example, uh, the, the participants uh, uh, most highly appreciated uh, support for harmonization of their learning goals with organizational goals. 
Um, then social context uh, has uh, also proved as influential, but not as influential as organizational context. Uh, regarding something that originates from the social context, uh, that usage information, so the information about, uh, uh, let's say, previous use of different kinds of learning resources was uh, particularly appreciated. And uh, we have uh, confirmed uh, the presence of that association or correlation between uh, the perceived usefulness of the technical support that the uh, tool provides on one hand and uh, the perceived usefulness of um, self-regulated self learning practices. And uh, uh, over, I mean, very detailed, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, report of, uh, of the study and its findings uh, is uh, given in this paper, uh, Self-Regulated Workplace Learning, Pedagogical Framework and Semantic Web-Based Environment, uh, which was submitted to uh, this Educational Technology and Society uh, journal. Um, maybe I should brag a bit and uh, say that um, um, this paper actually uh, comes, uh, results from um, uh, invitation um, because uh, our initial paper submitted to ICOLT and accepted and presented at ICOLT uh, last year uh, got the best paper award. Uh, so, yeah, probably something about our work. Um, so regarding what we are currently doing and what are future plans, of course, the first thing is uh, to finalize uh, the analysis of the data that was collected in this uh, second user study and uh, to see whether we can address some of um, the still open issues and still open questions, especially a lot of open issues uh, left uh, regarding that social context and influence of social context. Um, then uh, regarding uh, the development work, um, we first thing that we are doing, we, uh, we currently actually do heavily, is a redesign of the user interface since uh, a lot of users, uh, the major complaint actually was about uh, uh, the complexity of user interface. And um, we are really heavily working on that now. Um, Dragan Gashevich is especially involved in this, even though he has so many other things to do, but currently he's fo fully focused on this. Um, we are also working on uh, better documentation and sharing of learning experiences because this is something that is not um, let's say present uh, in, in a sufficient, uh, level, in sufficient level in LearnB. And uh, as a part of our, let's say, semantic web line of research and linked data line of research, uh, we're looking into how we can uh, contribute to that uh, huge link open data cloud that you have seen and one of those slides. Uh, in particular, the way that we want to, to contribute is uh, with the publication of uh, things, of course, that are that should be public. There, there are many things that are private data and uh, that should be, uh, let's say, uh, keep private. But things that like competencies, like uh, uh, semantic annotation of publicly available learning resources is something that uh, can be useful uh, for other, let's say, applications and other researchers. And that is something that we want to uh, pu publish on the web as link open data and have one small nod in that uh, huge network of uh, structured data. Yeah, and many other plans, but these are you know, some things that are currently on our radar. Uh, so, and these are just some paper that uh, have been published uh, so far regarding, uh, regarding this work. Yeah, that was, uh, that was what I wanted to say about this topic. There is another topic about organizational government management, but uh, as I said, maybe we should uh, uh, stop here and, and discuss this and uh, if you would be interested you can continue.